This is Kirby's dream course, and it's ridiculously fun. Forget Mario Party, if you're competitive enough, this game will make you hate your friends even more. Released in late 1994 in Japan and early 1995 in the US, Kirby's Dream Course would be the Super Nintendo debut for the God of Guzzling. <laughs> yeah, boy. But did you know that Kirby's Dream Course was initially designed as a game titled Special Tee Shot? Back in 1992, Special Tee Shot was a golf style game developed by Nintendo, complete with its own original characters. But this game would be put on pause for a bit until Nintendo decided to bring in HAL Laboratory to repurpose the game's framework with their new widely popular character, Kirby! With the working title Kirby's Tee Shot, this game would begin Kirby's Super Nintendo era. A significant time for him with three new mainline titles, five spin-offs, and a cancelled game called Kid Kirby developed by a young dev team in Scotland that would evolve into Rockstar North. Yes, I mean Grand Theft Auto Rockstar. But I'll set that project aside for the following video. Today we'll take a journey back to the 90s to explore the Kirby titles and spin-offs around the age of the Super Nintendo. I'm the Mentalk and welcome to my Origin Oracle series. I gotta do the YouTube thing and say if you like my content please leave a like or subscribe or bash me in the comments or whatever whatever. But if you haven't seen it already, I have a video up about Kirby's origins that leads into this video so go check that one out. Taking place after the Fountain of Dreams incident in Kirby's Adventure, Kirby's dream course begins with a peaceful day in Dreamland. Oh, you thought this game wouldn't have a story? Take a walk with me. The citizens of Dreamland have returned to their lazy lifestyles, gazing up into the night sky as they admire the stars. But one night, all the stars in the sky begin to vanish, driving the Dreamlandians into a state of collective depression. So just like the last two games, they don't know what to do with themselves, but Kirby notices something with his telescope. King DDD is the one up there taking the stars away, and in a panic oh, after noticing Kirby was noticing him, DDD races off dropping a star in the process, leading Kirby into a hot pursuit. The stage is set, so let's stop DDD by playing some f***ing golf. Kirby is your ball and you'll have to guide him through eight major courses within Kirby's dream course. The objective is to accurately whack him into all of the enemies on the map. Doing this reveals the final hole, and once Kirby rolls inside, you're off to the next level. I compared this to golf before, but this has a few other games baked into it, like billiards and bowling for instance. And they even implemented Kirby's signature copy powers, allowing players to implement these abilities into their shots, like the high jump power, fireball, or parasol. But if there's one thing I'll say about this game, the physics feel top notch. With each shot that you take, you can feel Kirby's weight through the sound effects and the way he bounces and rolls on this terrain. It's really satisfying, especially when your skill level starts to improve throughout the game. This game also boasts quite an ambitious competitive multiplayer mode, making this the very first game in the series to include multiplayer. Play alongside a friend and they'll get to play as a yellow version of Kirby, who was internally named Kibi by the developers. Kibi combines the word Kiro, meaning yellow in Japanese, and Kirby. And this wasn't supposed to be a separate character. The manual addresses this as Kirby just being yellow for player two, but as of 2022, within Kirby's Dream Buffet, Kibi makes an official cameo on one of the collectible character treats named Kirby and Kibi, the first time he'd be officially named as such in a game. So once Kirby rolls his way through all eight courses, there is a final boss with King DDD, who pulls up Eggman style in a giant robot called Robo DDD. Launch Kirby at his head a few times and you'll make quick work of this thing, and in turn, cure the depressed Dreamlanders by returning the stolen stars to the sky. It's actually impressive how much content is packed into this game, and if you have yet to try it out, play it one time with a friend and see what you think. It's available on the Nintendo Switch. But you'd think with the release of Kirby's Dream Course, Special Tee Shot would never see the light of day. But in fact, Nintendo did end up putting it out to the world in some form, a title for the Satellaview in 1996. The Satellaview is a peripheral exclusively made for the Super Famicom in Japan. And I've talked about it a few times before on this channel, both for Zelda and Mario, but this was a device where players were able to receive data through satellite transmissions directly to their Super Famicom system, which I guess could be looked at as a very, very early version of live service content that we see today. Special T-Shot would be exclusive to the Satellaview, keeping all of the original content but having more or less the same mechanics as Kirby's Dream Course. But just because Kirby was stripped from this game doesn't mean he never made an appearance on the Satellaview. I give you Kirby's Toy Box. I'm getting a little ahead of myself chronologically since this hit the market in 1996, but Kirby's Toy Box was a series of traditional games featuring Kirby that would be broadcast directly to the player's system. Depending on the time the player connected to the network via their Satellaview, a different game would be available for them to play. There's no story to discuss in the game this time, but let's take a look at some of these mini-games. Baseball is self-explanatory. The player will hit ball Kirby with a baseball bat in hopes of lining it up into the slots on the back of the field. 
There's actually a two player mode for this game as well. Pinball is pinball, with Kirby serving as the ball yet again. While the board itself is somewhat plain, it does have a few recognizable enemies from the series like King DDD, Krakow, and Waddle Dee. Star Break is a breakout style game with Kirby as the ball and two Ricks as the paddle. And I haven't even formally introduced Rick yet, but I guess we'll get to him shortly. Round and Round Ball is where the game names start to get a little bit more obscure, but the player will shoot Kirby at different speeds into a tube, attempting to drop him into holes deeper within the spiral. The further the hole, the more points you collect. Cannonball stars a giant Robo Rick who shoots Kirby's at the Robo Rick on the other side of the mountain until it's defeated. This is meant to be a two player game, but this also has the option of having a CPU as your opponent. A range ball has the player attempt to land Kirby into nine different holes on this pegboard, but you have to be strategic because you only have nine Kirby's to shoot. Anytime I run into Pachinko, I can never wrap my head around what's going on, but it looks like it's here in Kirby's toy box as well. The player is given two minutes to launch as many Kirby's as they want onto the board, attempting to land in various pockets. There's a Kirby in the center the player can aim to hit as well, which gives a chance at bonus points. And then finally, Ball Rally, a game where the player needs to time their button presses to guide Kirby through an obstacle course. So while there's not much depth to these games, this is Kirby's only presence on the Satella view, and Kirby's toy box would eventually end up as lost media, especially since Nintendo dubbed their Satella view peripheral a failure. It wouldn't be until 2016, 20 whole years later, where a group of preservationists managed to get their hands on a few of these minigames and upload them online to be emulated. More games would be uncovered by a different group at an auction in Japan and uploaded that same month. Finally, Ball Rally was the last minigame to be rediscovered in December 2020, uploaded online by a member of the Satellaview research blog, Satellablog. Now I know these games may seem simple, but as time goes on, we're gonna lose more and more games like this to obscurity. It's good that these preservationists take the time to rediscover this stuff and upload it for everybody to see. So major props to them for keeping these titles alive. So with Kirby ingraining himself as a mainstay Nintendo character, it was time for a mainline Kirby title to arrive on the Super Nintendo. But first, there was Kirby's Avalanche. He made me and my friend play this game, Avalanche, and he dumped all these little blobs on me. And the only way that I could survive was if I buried my buddy in boulders. Oh look, he's a cutie. He's just a guy. Many puzzle game enthusiasts now know that this game is basically that Japanese puzzle game, Puyo Puyo, in disguise. The concept is pretty simple. Match Puyo by colors, get four in a row, and you clear them from your side of the screen. Clear enough and you'll send garbage Puyos to the other side to take up space on your opponent's side of the screen. But this simple mechanic allows you to make some crazy combos that can cause utter frustration in a competitive setting. Little known fact about me, this is my favorite puzzle game and I'm actually really good at it. Cool. Developed by Compile in the early 90s, Puyo Puyo was its own puzzle spin-off to an RPG in Japan known as Mado Monogatari, which had its original set of lore and characters that would also star in Puyo Puyo. So when Compile wanted to release their Sega Mega Drive version to an international audience, Sega made the marketing decision to remove all the Mado Monogatari cast and replace them with Dr. Robotnik and his minions from the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog TV series running at that time. And so we got Dr. Robotnik's Mean Beat Machine in 1993. And as a kid from that time, this marketing decision worked on me. But Nintendo would also jump on this idea with the Super Nintendo release of Super Puyo Puyo being reskinned to make Kirby's Avalanche or as they know it in Europe, Kirby's Ghost Trap. Neither Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine or Kirby's Avalanche would be released in Japan, making them the first Western exclusive Sonic and Kirby titles to hit the market. But I don't blame Nintendo and HAL for slapping Kirby on the front of all these spin-offs. It's a decent business decision. But you guessed it, this game has a story. We return to Dreamland once again, discovering that its citizens have a local pastime called Avalanche, a puzzle game that looks a lot like Puyo Puyo. So when they're not sleeping and watching stars all day, the Dreamlanders are practicing to be the Avalanche Champion at the first annual Dreamlands Avalanche competition. With this being the biggest event in the history of Dreamland, everyone will travel by foot to the Dream Fountain, and if one Dreamlander happens to stumble upon another, they must face off in an Avalanche match. The winner is the one who can continue forward, leading to the final matches at the Dream Fountain. Kirby decides to take part in this event as well, which is more or less what happens during the events of the game as you stumble upon a ton of enemies from the Kirby franchise like Waddle Dees, Wispy Woods, Krakow, Meta Knight, and as you probably guessed the final match is with King DDD. I think this is the only game where Kirby speaks in complete sentences. I'm so scared. So for those of you keeping score, at this stage of the Kirby game, that is two mainline titles and three spin-off games. So I guess at this point, it's about time that Nintendo and HAL made a mainline title for the Super Nintendo, right? 
Kirby's Dream Land 2 for the Game Boy. Yeah, instead we got a sequel to the game that started it all. The naming convention here had me curious if the Kirby games had some ridiculous timeline thing going on like Zelda, Sonic, and to a certain extent Mario, and I stumbled upon this. So I'm not even going to try to make sense of this image yet, so let's just enjoy the ride. But what I've uncovered about this game is that it would be the very first entry in what's known as the Dark Matter Trilogy. So Kirby's Dream Land 2 has a new enemy arise from the shadows. Dark Matter, another entity of darkness, steals the rainbows that connect the rainbow islands of Dream Land and attempts to cover the world in darkness. Dark Matter possesses King DDD as well to assist him in his evil deeds, which has Kirby step up once again to save Dream Land. Kirby this time is joined by three brand new animal friends, Rick the Hamster, Kind the Fish, and Koo the Owl, each giving Kirby unique abilities to help him on his adventure. But let's not forget Gooey. Hi. He'll pop out of bags where the animal friend should be if Kirby already has that respective animal. So Gooey just heals Kirby instead. This may seem minor, but Gooey will be more important later. Just know that he exists right now. These animal friends spawn from the idea of Kirby originally riding around in a tank, some kind of submersible, and a rocket ship or UFO. You can see all of these in the original concept art, but they were scrapped in place of the animal friends. But all of these would eventually get some kind of representation in the series, most prominently in Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. Much like Kirby's Dream Land, Dream Land 2 is a traditional platformer with Kirby having his basic moveset to inhale, swallow, and fly. But this time, elements from Kirby's adventure carried over into this game like the copy ability. But unlike its predecessor, Dream Land 2 only has 7 abilities. But just because there's less doesn't mean they weren't cooking with this game. Kirby can combine his copy powers with these animal friends to not only increase the damage of their attacks, but change up the style of attack as well. So while there are only 7 copy abilities, there are a total of 21 different combinations that can be explored here. So during Kirby's new adventure with his animal best buds, they'll travel to 7 unique locations on the Rainbow Islands, each with their own set of stages and a boss that must be defeated to get to the next island. We see familiar bosses from previous games like Wispy Woods, who seem to have caught the plague this time around, Mr. Shine and Mr. Bright, Krakow, and of course King DDD. Once Kirby and his friends have braved the Rainbow Islands, it's time to face King DDD at the Dark Castle. The player can head right in and give DDD a proper beatdown, which leads the whole gang to head home in the rain and call it a day. But wait a second. Huh? The end? I guess we assume if you do things this way, Dark Matter ended up plunging the world into darkness. So to get the real ending, the goal is to find the hidden rainbow drops on each island as you play through the game, encouraging the player to explore the worlds and collect all seven, like Chaos Emeralds. Challenge DDD once again with all the rainbow drops and Kirby will assemble the Rainbow Sword which summons Dark Matter out of hiding and the two take their fight into space, where they engage in this epic cosmic sword fight. Kirby makes quick work of him, but this is a Kirby game. There has to be two forms. Hi! Now after Dark Matter shows his true form, Kirby can finally destroy him with his rainbow sword, bringing peace back to dreamland as his animal friends and DDD look up into the sky. The credits roll with Kirby doing cute little air tricks and waving at the player, it's adorable. But in the final shot, we see Kirby restore the rainbow bridges with his new sword. So as someone who's just starting to dive deep into the Kirby lore and like the Kirby games, I assumed that this ridiculous sword would make another appearance down the line in like future games. It doesn't! What happened? <laughs> but like the Star Rod and previous Kirby titles, this sword will continue the trend of Kirby having some kind of final weapon handy at the end of each game. Okay, so Kirby's Dream Land 2 launched in March 1995. That means the Super Nintendo's been out five years at this point. So is it finally time for that mainline Super Nintendo Kirby game? Kirby's Block Ball. More like Kirby's Blue Ball, am I right? <laughs> Another spin-off title, this time for the Game Boy. Kirby is slapped on another style of puzzle game, Breakout. But I'd be doing this game a disservice if I said it was just a reskinned puzzle game. This is definitely much more elaborate than Star Break from Kirby's Toy Box, and actually has quite a few things going for it. King DDD is up to no good and steals the five sparkling stars again, so to get them back, Kirby must fight his way up through each stage to reach DDD in his castle. There are 10 worlds in total, and Kirby once again decides to flex and save Dreamland in ball form. If you've played Breakout before, it's pretty much that. But if you time your button presses when Kirby lands on the paddles, you'll return to full size and do more damage to blocks and enemies. Not only will Kirby have to take on bosses in this format, he can copy abilities as well when he defeats the right enemies, allowing him to use burn, needle, spark, and stone powers. There's even bonus minigames in here that you can play like Air Hockey, Star Catcher, 
and UpCloud. What's UpCloud? Got it! The polish on this game is no coincidence though. It was the team at Nintendo R&D 1 who oversaw this project. The same team that famously made Super Mario Land 1 and 2 and the Wario Land series. And they would develop this game in collaboration with Tosei, who was known for the legendary Starfy series. But that doesn't mean Hal wasn't involved either. Back in 2011, Satoru Iwata would interview one of the developers who worked on Kirby's Block Ball, Hitoshi Yamagami, who stated, About 15 years ago, I worked on Kirby's Block Ball. At first, Hal Laboratory said it wasn't like Kirby. In the end, we spent about half a year on a major overhaul. They gave me thorough instruction on every aspect of Kirby's movement. To which Iwata replied, Yes, I remember. So for extra context, Iwata was president at HAL Laboratory when Kirby's Block Ball was developed, helping the company pull themselves out of debt, no doubt. But I go into that story in a little bit more detail in my last Kirby video if you're curious to hear about that. So after Kirby has annihilated most of DDD's minions, the second to last boss Kirby will face in this game is Brobo, who looks like a relative of Kirby in a robot suit. The interesting thing about this fight is that if you defeat Brobo without meeting all the borderline scores in all 10 stages of this game, you get a bad ending. Kirby will just decide to go home without finding DDD. So you play again and get all the correct scores in each stage and now you're able to face King DDD. You'll be hacking away at him for some time, but once defeated, Kirby can retrieve the sparkling stars and what I think is the dream fountain is under DDD's castle? Did he manage to move a whole fountain there? Are there multiple dream fountains in Dreamland? Let me finish all the games before I start theorizing. Speaking of all the games, when are we finally getting to that mainline Super Nintendo title? It must exist. Kirby Superstar, the first mainline Kirby game for the Super Nintendo. This was my entry point into the series many, many years ago, and personally, it's still one of my favorites. HAL Laboratory took a different approach this time around, structuring the game in an omnibus format, where the player can select from a set of six unique adventures for Kirby. These are all mostly self-contained stories with slightly different gameplay mechanics, and while only four are available to the player at the start of the game, the rest can be unlocked by completing the others. So let's start with the simplest, Spring Breeze. This game is a rehash of Kirby's Dreamland, with King DDD and his minions stealing all of the food from Dreamland. While it's a little bit more condensed than the original game, it was created as a short set of levels to introduce the updated gameplay style from Kirby Superstar, most of which carried over from Kirby's adventure. This includes the dash, slide, and of course, the copy ability, but now his appearance changes depending on the power. But wait a sec, what's this? Kirby can create a helper from his copy abilities? And a friend can take control of this helper? Nah, this is a 10 out of 10 game. And while the helper is limited to the power Kirby gives it, this was still a pretty big deal. It was cool in Sonic 2, but let's be real, Tails was just there to give your little sibling something to do. This here was true cooperative gameplay. The major bosses from the original make a return with these fancy new graphics, with Kirby once again oh, humbling Wispy Woods, Lolo and Lalala, La, and Krakow. Poor Kabula here got scrapped. But as is tradition, Kirby will scale Mount DDD to take on King DDD in his boxing ring once again, recreating the moment of their very first dance. Oh, and look, Mario and his friends pulled up to watch this time. So after DDD's defeat, the ending plays out just like Kirby's Dreamland, with Kirby using the sparkling stars to transform into a giant balloon to spread the missing food across Dreamland. I joked about this throughout the video, but this game took some time for a reason. It would be three years since Kirby's adventure, and while there were several Kirby games in between, this was the next project from Masahiro Sakurai, the creator of Kirby, the director and main designer of Kirby's Dreamland and Kirby's Adventure, and the one who would go on to create the Super Smash Bros. series. Shortly after the release of Kirby's Adventure in 1993, they began development of Kirby's Superstar soon after, and there were three major objectives Sakurai had in mind for this game, the first being two-player cooperative gameplay, an idea requested by the great Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyamoto realized that cooperative gameplay wasn't often seen in platforming games at that time, and while he wanted to incorporate this into the Super Mario franchise, it wouldn't fully come to fruition until New Super Mario Bros. Wii in 2009. But with Kirby's slower gameplay style, Sakurai took on the challenge, coming up with the helpers that I mentioned earlier. The second objective was to include mechanics from fighting games. Don't get me started on how fun it is using Fighter Kirby, oh my gosh. You feel so ridiculous and powerful, it's like one of my favorite abilities of all time. It's so great. But the implementation of fighting mechanics goes beyond just that. All the copy abilities have these little movesets that give them more variety, and Sakurai also decided to make enemies more durable to factor in the presence of the helper. The final objective was the omnibus format of the game, an idea Sakurai cooked up to create multiple segments within one game 
that delivered a variety of stories and styles of gameplay to keep things fresh for players. With all this in mind, development took three years, which may not seem like much now, but just to put it in perspective, Kirby got his first mainline Super Nintendo title three months prior to the release of the Nintendo 64. Sakura has stated that the groundbreaking CG graphics from Donkey Kong Country had something to do with this. There are various reasons that development dragged on, but one was the influence of Donkey Kong Country. Midway through development, it was decided that we should incorporate computer graphics, so we threw out the art we made up to that point. Of course, I could have refused to do it, but I was certain myself that there would be merits to using CG. So I don't feel it was forced on me. Rather, I feel like it happened at just the right time. So let's head back into the story with the next game, Dynablade, a giant cyborg bird that has metal wings. The intro is only a few seconds, with Kirby's nap being interrupted by a strong gust from Dynablade, so I'll defer to the manual for the true story here. A strange bird named Dynablade has come from the mountain and ruined the crops! Unless Kirby can stop him, Dreamland will be devastated. Alright Kirby, so let's go kill off the local wildlife. Gameplay is pretty straightforward here, and in my opinion, this is the story where the game truly begins. Kirby will hop from stage to stage, overcoming the usual obstacles and mini-bosses as he approaches Dynablade's nest. And there's an overworld map here where the player can select the next level, similar to the Super Mario series. And while there's no bosses in this mode to really discuss, there are a couple of cool new mini-bosses introduced in Kirby Superstar, like Chef Kawasaki and Iron Mom. These two introduce the brand new copy abilities Cook and Fighter, respectively. I already gushed over the fighter ability, but Cook is special. A one-time use ability that forces all enemies on screen into Kirby's pot. With everyone cooked alive, Kirby has food items that remain on screen for him to eat. <laughs> boy. Once Kirby arrives at Dynablade's nest on Candy Man, it's time for the final battle. And you have a few options for copy abilities given to you before the battle begins, so Dynablade isn't too hard to take down. Good work, Kirby. You've slain Dynablade and saved all the farmer's crops. But now we find out that you've slaughtered somebody's mother. <laughs> oh, shit. In his guilt, Kirby takes these chicks home and becomes their foster father, holding Whiskey Woods at gunpoint to offer his apples for them to eat, teaching them to fly, and once old enough, he sends them on their way. It's revealed at the very end that Dinah Blade survived, and I guess after getting assaulted in her own home and having her kids kidnapped, decides that they'll all relocate. Bro, what are you talking about, man? Next up is Gourmet Race, which is a much shorter game in comparison. It begins with Kirby seemingly on a pilgrimage to an orchard filled with food, but once he reaches this orchard, King DDD returns to challenge him to a special gourmet race to see who is the ultimate glutton. The game is structured as a Grand Prix with three courses, Pumpkin Grand, Corn Hall, and Onion Garden. The player will dash toward the finish line, picking up food items along the way to increase their score. Get to the finish line first and you get a bonus of 30 points. The one with the most points at the end of all three courses wins this challenge. It's pretty simple, but the best thing to come out of this game was this banger right here. While this theme is occasionally associated with King DDD, I'd argue that this song often represents the Kirby series as a whole. It's so good. Jun Ishikawa, who is the primary composer for the Kirby series, has stated that he was told to make a song in the vein of an athletic meet and took inspiration from the orchestral classic Chico's Post. And blended that sound with a ska rhythm, which would culminate into the final song, Gourmet Race. This track has stood the test of time and has been remixed several times throughout the series, so it definitely holds up and is still one of my favorites. The next game is Great Cave Offensive, which puts Kirby in the role as an adventurer. The objective is to explore a large cavern that's split up into four major stages, collecting as much treasure as you can find. This mode has 60 treasures in total and it can be challenging to get them all. Some treasures will be locked behind time challenges, rendering certain items to be completely missable if you don't time your platforming right. Despite its focus on treasure hunting, this mode still has a boss within each stage. Fatty Whale, Computer Virus, Camellio Arm, and Wham Bam Rock. All brand new enemies making their debut within Kirby Superstar. Get to the end and you'll be able to see every single treasure collected, and if you manage to get all 60, you're greeted with an image of Kirby coming part of the top 1%. Now before I continue, there was also a scrap game mode initially planned by Sakurai known as Kagero Mansion, dropped due to time constraint. It's like a horror game and was completely different from the usual Kirby game. Kirby finds himself in a mansion and under a curse, sealing his mouth shut. He can't suck in or spit out, so he can't copy. 
He would go around the mansion and for example get a copy ability of fire from a candle. I was planning a horror action game with puzzle elements. Unfortunately the team didn't get around to developing this, scrapping the idea pretty early in the concept phase. But this sounds extremely interesting to me, considering I have this fascination with creepy scenarios and non-horror games. Sakurai shared more information on the idea for this mode on his YouTube channel back in October 2022. Apparently Kirby would have chased a butterfly into a dark forest where a sentient wall clock that belonged to a wizard from ages past would have cast the curse that seals his mouth shut. He would also share a concept sketch of the candle Kirby would have gotten his firepower from. Though I'm completely shocked that there's no fan game or a creepypasta fan game that's been made about this yet. Revenge of Meta Knight is the next major game, and as the title suggests, Meta Knight finally steps up as the primary antagonist of this story. This episode begins in a much more cinematic format, with Meta Knight and his crew preparing to launch their airship, the Halberd, to take control of Dreamland, while Kirby here is coming in hot. After this thrilling little cutscene, you're thrown right into this high octane adventure as Kirby begins his siege on the airship. This opening shows how dangerous Kirby can be, with him obliterating these enemies before the player can even control him. The crew of the Halberd is composed of Meta Knight, the Meta Knights, his minions that debuted in Kirby's adventure, Captain Vol, the pilot, and Sailor Waddle Dee. And these are the characters that drive the story while Kirby lays waste to the Halberd as we're able to see their dialogue between one another while playing through the levels. So I always thought that this choice was inspired by Star Fox, where radio comms between the characters entirely drove the narrative, but I haven't found any interviews or direct quotes to support that theory. Either way, the dialogue from these characters adds a great deal of personality to this specific game mode, making it a favorite among fans, and this would also be my favorite of the bunch. This mode also has a time limit, and while it's pretty lenient, it's best to treat this like a time attack and move as quickly as possible. So at the end of the first chapter, Kirby takes on this big mech called Heavy Lobster, which manages to blow Kirby out into the ocean. This allows the crew to take off while Kirby tries to find a way back onto the airship. After a series of trials and tribulations and a couple of boss fights, Kirby manages to snag another warp star to head back to the Halberd. And oh! Got he! <laughs> Got he! <laughs> Well, all hope isn't lost because he falls right back to Candy Mountain, where he'll seek the help of his one-time nemesis, Dinoblade. Please don't hurt my family. Despite heavy fire from the Halberd, Dinoblade manages to drop Kirby off, who spends the rest of this segment tearing the ship apart piece by piece and offing the crew one by one. With his reactor destroyed, the Halberd begins its rapid descent, and the crew begins emergency evacuation. But Kirby and Meta Knight have a score to settle. Meta Knight challenges him to a duel and Kirby picks up his sword and the two go at it in some badass sword fight. Man, this was so cool. After an intense battle, Kirby is victorious, slicing Meta Knight's mask in two, and it shows his face is just as adorable. Hi. With the halberd descending quickly, Kirby rushes to the lower level of the ship and finds a wheelie, hopping on its back for one final rush to the end. The ticking clock, the intense music, the high speed movement, Meta Knight returning with wings to try and stop you. This is all just mwah. Kirby escapes with his new wheelie friend, riding off into the sunset. We'll see Meta Knight again someday, but for now, you've earned your rest, Kirby. Just kidding. Milky Way Wishes is the final main game that's unlocked once all other major stories are completed. Dreamland is once again in crisis. The sun and moon in the sky are fighting, causing it to shift constantly into day and night. As Kirby and other citizens look into the sky, a 100% trustworthy jester named Marx pulls up and tells Kirby that their only hope is to summon the power of a comet called Nova by using the energy of the surrounding planets in the Milky Way. Yeah. So with his mission clear, Kirby takes a warp star into space as we leave the planet for the very first time. The gameplay of this story is more or less a combination of everything you've learned up to this point. But as an added gameplay element, Kirby can't just swallow enemies to obtain their powers. In each stage, he must collect special items to get that specific power. But once you collect it, you'll have the ability permanently, and the player can select it at any time. Many of the bosses you face in other stories return in more powerful forms as Kirby visits each planet. So despite all of the resistance, Kirby does successfully collect the energy needed from all seven planets, and summons Nova as instructed. This thing being considered a comet is wild to me. But just as Mark said, it does offer Kirby one wish. But just before Kirby can speak, Mark shoves him out the way, oh, the, the deception! and he makes a wish to control Popstar. Actually, this moment is the first time Kirby's entire planet is referred to as Planet Popstar in the series, so I can start calling it that now. 
But anyway, the situation gets worse with Nova granting Mark's wish, giving him the power to control Popstar while Kirby floats off into space. But this isn't over yet. The stars he collected from the planets come together to form the Starship, Kirby's final power in this game. He heads into Nova to take it down from the inside, with this whole thing turning into an epic shoot-em-up. Like, I'm so happy I get to talk about this. This game has everything. So after destroying Nova's core, it's time to take down Mark's. No long talking. Just jump his ass, Kirby. The battle ends and Kirby sends Marks flying into Nova. The two collide and explode, bringing peace back to Popstar while the sun and moon return to good terms. As for Kirby, he can finally take that long rest. And that closes the chapter of Kirby Superstar, which personally deserved its own video considering all the content that's packed within this game. There are other modes here like the arena where you can test your skills against all the bosses from the game one after the other. Then there are the two mini games, Megaton Punch and Samurai Kirby. Megaton Punch has you timing button presses to see who can leave the biggest crack in the ground. And if you're really good at this, the results get pretty ridiculous. Mario and friends decided to watch this one go down as well. Samurai Kirby focuses on your reaction time, with Kirby facing off an opponent in a showdown. Once his exclamation mark appears, you have to press any button faster than the opponent. And I will say the later enemies like King DDD and Meta Knight are very tricky to beat but it's extremely satisfying. Funny enough, these two minigames were teased in Kirby's Toy Box, which would have aired for the Satellaview on February 22nd, 1996, a couple weeks before the release of Kirby Superstar. Those demo versions of these minigames were lost to time, and I'm sure are still being sought out by preservationists, even if it's identical to the final game. But Kirby Superstar was both a critical and commercial success, with over 1 million copies sold in Japan. PAL Laboratory would revisit the title back in 2008 with Kirby Superstar Ultra for the Nintendo DS, complete with new graphics and game modes, but I'll cover this a little more closely once we get to that era. So what was next after Kirby Superstar? You would figure that after this there would be a little bit more time before the next major game. But it wasn't time for Kirby to hang up his sleepy hat just yet. Yes, another spin-off puzzle game for Kirby fans to chew on, Kirby Star Stacker for the Game Boy. Released in early 1997, this was a block-based puzzle game that's easy to compare to Tetris, but let me explain. Blocks with Kirby's animal friends will fall from the top of your screen, and the goal is to sandwich the stars on the screen between two matching blocks. So keep scoring stars and make sure the blocks don't stack too high, that's the basics of the game. The main game has you playing against DDD, who's mainly there to pound the ground with his fist to add more blocks and laugh at you. <laughs> Nintendo and HAL decided to release a complete remake of this game exclusively in Japan for the Super Famicom. This time with overhauled graphics, and you guessed it, a story. It's a normal starry night in Dreamland, until an alien named Mr. Star flies past Dreamland while traveling through space. King DDD, with his spectacular eye, shoots him down with a cannon, gruesomely splitting him apart into several pieces that land across Dreamland. One of them lands on Kirby's head while he's out on some camping trip, but he's quick to figure out that Mr. Star needs help collecting his organs across Dreamland. So Kirby goes on another adventure with his animal friends to beat the enemies that have Mr. Star's pieces. So with this new story comes a whole set of enemies you can now face off against in story mode, which are mostly established characters from the series like Chef Kawasaki who fully cemented himself into the Kirby roster after his debut. Once Kirby defeats DDD, all of Mr. Star is collected and he heads back into space. But after the credits, there's one surprise boss left. Grill. A random witch that comes to test Kirby at the end of the game. I looked further into Grill here to see if she was a reference to something else, but nope, she's completely original and has made minor cameos in future titles as stickers and stuff like that. But nothing substantial after this. But it's interesting to see that she's still a reference from time to time. This version of Kirby's Star Stacker was released for the Super Famicom in February 1998, making this the final Kirby game for this system. But there's one last game we have to cover to put a cap on Kirby's Super Nintendo era. Kirby's Dreamland 3, this time for the Super Nintendo. Released in November 1997, this would be the next installment of the Dreamland series and the second game in the Dark Matter trilogy. Kirby still had one last mainline game in the chamber, but Sakurai wasn't directing this one. Shinichi Shimomura of HAL Laboratory, who also directed Kirby's Dreamland 2, would take over director and lead designer duties for this title as well. This game begins with a peaceful day on Kirby's now named planet, Popstar. So it looks like after Dreamland 2, Kirby and Gooey are good friends that go fishing together in their downtime. But suddenly, 
Darkness appears in the sky, enveloping the planet in its tendrils. Somehow, dark matter returned. To make matters worse, the clouds it emits possess King DDD, his minions, and the citizens of Popstar, causing chaos around the planet. So Kirby and his animal friends step up once again to save the day. That's right, the squad, Rick, Ku, Kine, and Gooey return, which brings Kirby back to a simpler formula after the intensity of Kirby's superstar. There are five major levels to explore across Popstar as Kirby and his friends seek to free possess citizens from Dark Matter's grasp. The gameplay is closer to the style of Kirby's Dream Land 2, with Kirby utilizing his animal friends to traverse these levels, but this time, three new ones join the fray. Nago the Calico Cat, who gives Kirby the ability to triple jump, Pitch the Bird, who doesn't fly as well as Ku, but has more combinations Kirby can use with his copy powers, and Choo Choo the Octopus, who sits on Kirby's head and... What's happening here? <laughs> but seriously, the team combinations this time around are extremely clever, like the burning power allowing Choo Choo to float like a hot air balloon, or the spark power allowing Kirby to use a remote control to make Pitch fly around like a toy plane. There may be only 9 copy abilities in this game, but with all of these new animal friends, you're looking at 48 unique combinations. The animations are so detailed here and the sketch-like graphical style complements these characters' movements. But before we move on to the conclusion of this tale, let's talk about Gooey for a second. Gooey had a rather minor appearance in Kirby's Dream Land 2, but it's casually revealed within the manual for Kirby's Dream Land 3 that he's made from the same stuff as Dark Matter. He doesn't have an evil spirit though, so we're all good, right? Regardless, this is pretty interesting lore. But what is this stuff that they're referring to here? Darkness. Anyway, similarly to Kirby's Superstar, this game supports cooperative gameplay, with player 2 being able to control Gooey, giving him similar abilities to Kirby, but instead he uses his tongue to swallow things. Kirby will encounter mostly new bosses in this title since we're saving possessed people this time around, like Akro, Kon and Kon, and Ado the painter, who will paint the bosses from Dreamland 2 to attack Kirby. I thought that was really clever. The mainstays in the series, Wispy Woods and King DDD, return as bosses as well, but we know something much more sinister is at work here. So much like Kirby's Dreamland 2, you may receive a bad ending after defeating DDD, with Kirby just deciding to go home while poor DDD is having a stroke on the roof of his castle. You're supposed to collect 30 heart stars along your journey by completing very specific tasks like not stepping on this tulip in the first stage, or recovering the lost shell for a snail, or defeating these metroids in a cave for Samus? Oh my gosh, she even takes her helmet off for him. Is it confirmed that Samus and Kirby are in the same universe by the way? Maybe this is a theory I can explore later. So with all the heart stars collected, Kirby can now enter level 6, the Hyper Zone with all of his stars coming together to form this game's final weapon, the Love Love Stick. The game throws you right into a rematch with Dark Matter, which is very similar to their last battle, but with all of this love on his side, Kirby isn't going down. Happiness wins again and Dark Matter sits here exploding, but there's a plot twist. It's been this eye all along! Yeah, this thing is called Zero, and it's the creature that's able to create Dark Matter, which I'm assuming have been leaking out from his dimension into Kirby's. And if throwing dark matters at you wasn't enough, it decides to leak blood onto Kirby with slits in its eye. Yuck. And even when it's defeated the first time, it explodes into this bloody mess and this red inner eye pops out. This boss must have had some kids extremely anxious. But after relentless beatings from the Love Love Stick, Kirby defeats Zero and returns to Dreamland victorious, hanging out peacefully with all of his friends and King DDD, who looks like he's having an episode of social anxiety here. But with the day saved, Kirby has brought peace to Popstar once again, and with this final game, concludes his time on the Super Nintendo. Making this video has re-established my love for the Kirby series. I mean, there's so much care and detail in the games themselves, and even the spin-offs have like a certain amount of charm to them. And so far, it's been a thrill to see this evolution happen from the very beginning. So next up, we'll explore Kirby's transition into the 3D realm. And I'm still waiting for this crazy lore I've been hearing about.